Okay, so without further delay, so let's start. And uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Christine Edwards. And she is a professor of nutrition uh, physiology at the University of uh, Glasgow in the United Kingdom. So that's a Again, the beauty, we have a Zoom meeting, we can invite uh, speakers from that far away and uh, really appreciate you can join us. And she uh, leads the human nutrition unit in the School of Medicine and Dentistry and Nursing. And her research uh, focuses on the gut microbiome functions, factors affecting uh, colo uh, colonizations, and the influence of diet and the production of bioactive molecules, including uh, phenol acid, phenolic acids and short-chain fatty acids. And we have another uh, moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Naisi Zhao, and she is a research assistant professor uh, in, in the uh, Department of uh, uh, Public Health and Community uh, Medicine, and just our uh, neighbor here. And uh, uh, Dr. Zhao is, uh, um, you know, has been focusing on uh, uh, like microbiome and other omics biomarkers and uh, uh, use that as a, 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 you know, uh, you know, as a biomarker for a personalized or precision medicine or precision uh, health. So uh, she has been uh, a uh, working on that uh, area uh, for quite uh, quite a long time. And her work uh, in, include developing and integrating uh, ecological relevance and the statistical models and to uh, integrate those biomarkers for the uh, for the uh, 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 the precision uh, nutrition uh, precision medicine and and house. So without further delay, I gave the uh, uh, the podium to you. Thank you so much. So thank you uh, very much um, for uh, inviting me to give a presentation today. And I'm very honoured to join you um, from the UK. Um, and uh, in my first slide here, I am showing to you the University of Glasgow, or at least part of it. You know, Glasgow University is the fourth oldest um, English-speaking university in the world. Um, and uh, it was founded, I think, before America um, was even discovered by Columbus. So we are a very old university. Today, um, I want to talk um, about the importance of the gut microbiota and diet interactions in the release of bioactive um, molecules um, and thinking about their functions um, in the body as well. So the first thing um, that I want to consider is the fact that not all people are the same. Um, and we have had a lot of uh, research into the gut microbiota over the last decades. And in fact, uh, I have been studying the gut microbiota since my PhD back in 1980, 84. And um, I have uh, been looking at this, lots of things have changed, but lots of things have also remained the same. So people have different microbiota. Uh, they have a different diet, um, a background diet, which is going to influence the microbiota. But they also have um, different uh, gut physiology. They may be people who have faster transit or more efficient absorption of things in the small intestine. And they may also have difference in uh, intestinal tolerance. So some people mm. can have a lot of fermentation and activity in their gut and not even notice it. 
and other people may get very distressed if they feel some slight gas or some slight uh, discomfort, and that may put them off eating uh, the sorts of diets. And this all means that we have a very different metabolic profile um, as individuals, and we may respond differently to changes in our diet. Now, one of the main um, fuels for the gut microbiota is um, plant food, and in particular, dietary fiber. Um, and there's a big difference when we are studying the impact of fiber on the gut microbiota um, as to whether um, uh, we get a good release of um, uh, nutrients um, and bioactive products from the fiber. If we eat it as um, a single compound, carbohydrate, or if it's in the complex um, uh, food matrix, which is how we should really be eating it. So we need to think about how um, the impact on the gut microbiota um, may change depending on how we're actually eating the food. Now, there are lots of things that happen when we ferment dietary fiber. Uh, we produce lots of short chain fatty acids mainly acetate, propionate, and butyrate. We also produce uh, a lot of gas, most of which is probably carbon dioxide, but also methane and hydrogen, and uh, perhaps less socially desirable, hydrogen sulfide. Hmm. Um, and and so we need to think about the gases um, because often these can help us to understand what's happening in the body and also what is influencing people. The other thing that happens when we ferment the fiber is we get loss of structure, um, which means that um, a lot of other molecules that are contained within that structure are released. The bacteria may metabolize these um, or they may be absorbed directly. And we lose water holding capacity because the short chain fatty acids are the main um, uh, route. The absorption of those take the water with them. And so we get um, a considerable amount of water being absorbed in the large intestine where the short chain fatty acids are produced. Another important element is that as we ferment carbohydrate, we reduce colonic pH and it can be as low as 4.5 in the proximal colon. And um, this means that we can um, have very different uh, chemistry in the um, colon as well, which may affect the state of molecules in terms of whether they are ionized mm. or not, and if they are absorbed or if they interact with other molecules um, uh, that uh, may bind to them or may entrap them. The other thing to be aware of is that not all dietary fibers are the same. There are lots of different types of molecules. Some are small, some are very complex. Some of them are physically very strong and require the bacteria to bind to them to, um, uh, I'm thinking of things like uh, wheat bran here, where the bacteria actually have to bind onto them so that they can digest the material very slowly. Um, and the fermentability of all of these different carbohydrates is, um, is very variable as well. Some are absorbed, um, fermented very quickly. Some may resist um, the fermentation. Some may um, be fermented completely in the proximal colon, and others may work their way through the large intestine um, and be only partially fermented and um, ex exit uh, when we go to the toilet, um, still intact or partially intact. And of course, there is a very rich gut microbiota, and I'm sure you've heard a lot more about them in the other um, lectures in this series, 
but most of the um, carbohydrate fermentation that occurs is performed by a consortium of bacteria. So we have some bacteria that do partial reactions and then what they have left unfermented or some of the products that they have fermented um, are then degraded further by other bacteria. So for example, guar gum, which is a um, galactomannan, has some bacteria that break it into smaller pieces. And when those smaller pieces are available, other bacteria that couldn't touch the polysaccharide are then able to um, digest some of the um, a smaller molecules. So a consortium is really needed. And in this diagram, I have tried to summarize the impact of fiber as it goes around the intestine and the um, impact that has on, on the gut and the bacteria. So here we have in the small intestine, depending on what the fiber is, it may slow down material getting to the colon. It may slow down absorption so that things that normally get absorbed in the upper intestine actually reach the colon and can have some influence there. As we come into the proximal colon, this is where most of the fermentation occurs and the contents are reasonably liquid. Um, the bacteria will ferment, um, the, uh, the pH will drop, so it's here that you get these very low pHs, and it's here that you get a lot of the absorption of short-chain fatty acids and other molecules. Um, and what's important here is the gut barrier function, so the bacteria and their products can help make very healthy gut mucosa in the colon and keep things um, intact. There's a lot of mucus that is secreted across the gut wall and the bacteria will also ferment that. Um, and you can see that if you look at germ-free animals, they have a very full colon full of mucus, but the bacteria are really um, fermenting that. And then as we come through into the distal colon, things become more solid as we start to produce fecal material. Um, but the pH is now higher, so different fermentations occurring here, a lot of protein fermentation, a lot of production of less desirable um, products, some of which can be toxic, and eventually then, of course, that is being um, uh, excreted as fecal material. Now, with the new methods of looking at gut bacteria, one of the um, terms that is heard a lot is the term of diversity. And sometimes this means the diversity in an individual, and sometimes it's a comparison of diversities between individuals. But in a simple uh, uh, way of looking at it, if we have very limited material getting into the large intestine, then we get um, a, a low diversity of food, a low diversity of um, bacteria. And then as we increase the diversity of the dietary fiber and also other products like polyphenols from fruits and veg and uh, red wine and, and, and many other um, plant derived products, then we can make the diversity of the diet much richer the materials that are getting into the colon are much richer, and theoretically that should um, increase the diversity of the uh, bacteria, the microbiota. Problem is that the evidence for this is not as strong as, uh, uh, as we would like. There's not enough studies that is, uh, is doing, um, proving that. Now, because of this very rich microbiota and the many different molecules that are being produced by them, there is a lot of uh, molecules that are absorbed into the body and go into the bloodstream and then interact with other parts of the body. So we're hearing the term axis a lot now, the gut brain axis, the gut liver axis, the gut lung axis, uh, any organ in the body axis with the gut. 
And this is really important because we need to understand how there could be a two-way traffic between the different body systems and the gut. But as well as the material um, and these molecules getting to the tissues, they are also stimulating receptors, which are releasing hormones, which can then impact on all the body systems as well. So um, two um, elements that have been really studied in terms of their effects um, in uh, this axis with other tissues are the short chain fatty acids, especially propionate, and the phenolic acids from polyphenols, of which there are very many, and the different ones come from different polyphenol molecules, but also some potentially negative things like phenols and cresols that can come from protein metabolism and which can have more negative effects in the body. There are more um, animal studies and human studies showing interactions of these molecules um, uh, on brain function. Um, and sometimes again, those uh, effects might be increases in cognitive function, but they can also be uh, negative impacts. And so there has been a lot of talk about the microbiota and uh, depression, cognitive function, and also um, uh, uh, things like uh, behavioral problems. So we need to have a good understanding of what that really is. So in very simple terms, um, talking about the short chain fatty acids that are produced, acetate is the short chain fatty acids that's, that's produced in the greatest amount, mm, probably about 60% of what is produced. Um, and it is the main short chain fatty acid to reach the systemic blood. Um, it's used um, for energy by uh, the cells, and of course our liver can also produce acetate. Um, but one of the main things that it does is produce fat. Um, acetate and um, acetyl-CoA is the beginning of fat production. And if we label acetate, uh, sorry, if we label fiber in cells and then feed it to animals, we find that most of the label is appearing in subcutaneous fat. So we know that acetate is producing um, uh, uh, fat in the body. It may influence satiety, it may increase energy salvage, and you can see this because germ-free rats need more food to get the same weight gain as um, uh, rats um, um, with a, a good microbiota. Propionate is one of the short chain fatty acids that's had a lot of interest um, as a potentially health uh, giving short chain fatty acids. It inhibits cholesterol synthesis, it inhibits lipid synthesis, um, especially when its uh, proportion is increased relative to acetate and it also increases insulin sensitivity. Um, and it is um, very uh, important um, in lots of other ways that we recognize now, because it is a main um, uh, effector or um, binds to the uh, G proteins uh, receptors, uh, 41 and 43, which you might also hear called um, free fatty acid receptors 2, uh, free fatty acid receptor 3, and these release hormones like PYY and GIP, which um, influence satiety, but may also have many other functions. And these receptors are present throughout the body um, and so we are now aware that short chain fatty acids may be affecting um, lots of different body functions, including the brain, and in fact, increasing propionate into the brain, even um, using functional MRI has suggested that people will choose more healthy foods if they have more propionate um, uh, reaching um, to the brain. So this is a, a very important molecule. The other short chain fatty acids can also bind to these, but propionate is the main one. Now, butyrate, we have thought for a very long time, is very healthy. Um, it's the preferred fuel for the colonic cells. They prefer to use butyrate over any other 
a short chain fatty acid for energy and definitely in preference to glucose. Um, and it promotes a healthy colonic mucosa. So it helps the barrier function in the small intestine as well as the large intestine, and it helps heal mucosa. But as I tell, um, will show you in a minute, um, sometimes we get paradoxical results, um, which are very clear um, and make us realize how little we really understand about this interaction. Um, butyrate also um, stimulates apoptosis, so programmed cell death. So it helps cells to die in the in the colon when they're meant to uh, by um, suicide rather than by inflammation um, uh, damage. And it also has lots of effects on differentiation of cancer cell lines um, in vitro and therefore may have some anti-cancer effects. But as I was saying, sometimes the impact of the microbiota is unexpected. So um, in this study that we um, published in 2014, we were looking at uh, children with Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is a, a sort of autoimmune disease um, which affects the whole gut. And in children, this is very devastating because they cannot absorb their food. They get very bloody diarrhea. They don't grow properly. They're in pain and they have a lot of time um, out of school. Um, and in the UK and Europe, one of the main treatments is to put them on a completely liquid and completely absorbable diet, which in eight weeks can bring them into remission. Um, and in this study, um, we wanted to find out what that did to the gut microbiota and what um, uh, relationship there was between the gut microbiota and um, the health of the children. Um, and the thing here was that actually everything was the opposite to what we expected. So children who recovered um, reduce their bacterial diversity, they reduce their short chain fatty acids, uh, fecal bacteria and pranitiae, which was meant to be the magical organism, decreased in those that got better. And um, it really did uh, show us that actually um, to um, improve the health of these children, they needed to suppress the bacteria and not to increase um, um, fibers and other things and not to increase butyrate. Butyrate, a high butyrate was actually a negative association with gut health in these children. So we do need to be careful about assuming that everything works the same way all the time. And now my colleagues in Glasgow are creating real diets with real foods that mimics the impacts of this liquid diet and brings the children into um, remission. And of course, gives them a much better nutritional um, uh, profile and they can grow and, and, and be much more healthy. Now, I talked about propionic acid um, and we were trying to find out, well, what, what um, can you do to increase propionic acid if it's going to be so um, healthy um, and influence uh, um, all of these body systems and uh, increase satiety? Um, and one of the things that we looked at was, um, is it the um, bonds in, in the... Um, in the carbohydrates because it appeared that uh, beta bonds were very important for um, propionic acid production. So we fermented uh, disaccharides. We got every single glucose disaccharide. There could be bar one, which we just couldn't get. And we fermented um, glucose one, one, diglucose one, two, one, three, one, four, one, six, every single disaccharide that we could and then we looked to see if they were alpha bonds or beta bonds and whether we got more or less butyrate uh, and propionate from these. And there were some very small differences, but we really didn't see a massive impact on propionate production. So there's small differences here, but very little. And so we then did a systematic review of every study where anyone 
um, fermented any carbohydrates um, and uh, looked to see what impact it had on propionate uh, uh, production. And this was a huge piece of work um, because we had to recalculate all of the results from all of these studies to make them compatible, um, correcting them for the amount of carbohydrate for other uh, factors in the fermentations. And what we found was the main predictor was the amount of fermentable material and um, not the specific fibers. So to have more propionate, you needed more fermentation and not necessarily fibers, which we knew as a percentage would produce more uh, propionate. Now, the other um, compounds that we're very interested in in Glasgow were polyphenols. So these are things like quercetin um, and phocyanins um, and many other molecules that are, if we think about them as the colors in foods. Um, and in the plants, they have lots of functions. They are anti-infection, they are antioxidant, they have lots of different protective properties. And when we eat them, the polysaccharides can give us lots of benefits as well. But when they get to the colon, the um, bacteria break them down into smaller molecules, which we just call phenolic acids. And some of these have been shown to have impacts on inflammation in the body, on um, uh, blood pressure, on lots of other functions. So we were interested to see what influenced these. And um, some of these small molecules get through to the brain and again can affect cognitive function and, and health. So um, we wanted to see if we could increase the productions of the more healthy um, versions of these phenolic acids. Um, and Again, there's a lot of different molecules. So some of them are just phenolic acids, some of them are urolithins, and some of them are isoflavones, which can have hormone-like properties. So there's a huge variation in these um, metabolites, and there's a great variability in the molecules that can be produced. Um, and so we need to have um, a lot of information to try and understand um, what's going on so we can promote the healthier ones. And um, partly uh, the term um, microbial metabolites means what sort of molecules an individual person and their microbiota produce from the same compound. So different people will produce different types of phenolic acids. And I've just put on here a, a review article that um, is very useful for understanding that for those who are interested. Um, so in this study, um, this is an in vitro study looking at different fibers, so a fructo oligosaccharide, dispergula, and pectin, and looking at the total phenolic acids that are produced. And um, here we can see this is the fecal slurry on its own. And as you put in fibers, you can increase the phenolic acids that are produced uh, from the parent compounds, from rutin and quercetin. Um, and this may differ depending on um, your um, racial background, but this may be diet, but um, it's in Glasgow, we studied Caucasians in Glasgow, and we studied people from South India who were living in Glasgow as well. And you can see here that um, when we put them on a low polyphenol diet, and compared them to when they were on a high polyphenol diet, this is the excretion in urine of phenolic acid. So that means they've been absorbed into the body and excreted. You can see that um, actually uh, the eating of the high polyphenol diet had a bigger impact on the uh, Caucasians than the Asians. And that may well be because there's more polyphenols normally in their diet and they have found other ways of utilizing them in the body. And here you can see again that in this is in an in vitro culture. So rather than being um, uh, in the body, this is just taking feces and fermenting it with the polyphenols. And you can see that the um, Asians are producing uh, small molecules of phenolic acids very quickly. 
Um, and then, uh, so we're within six hours of the fermentation and then not much different to the, Euro the Europeans or the Caucasians um, uh, at 24 hours. So it looks like the uh, molecules are being very produced very quickly in the South um, Indians um, and therefore um, being utilized in the body much more quickly. So leading on from that, we then try to look at the different fibers and um, uh, polyphenol production in vitro. And we looked at a whole range of fibers. So we've got here pectin and inulin, ispigula, resistant maltodextrin, wheat bran and cellulose. And we looked at different uh, times and also increasing, going in this direction, increasing amounts of fiber. So lots and lots of in vitro fermentations. Um, and you can see that there are some differences between fibers. This is without rutin. This is with rutin. And here we can see significant effect with inulin and resistant maltodextrin and wheat bran, which all have very fermentable components. And as you increase the fiber, you get an increase in the phenolic acids produced from the same concentrations of, um, of rutin. And this is looking here mostly at 3,4-dihydroxyphenylacetic um, acid. So this is um, one particular bioactive phenolic acid that is being produced. So having done that in vitro, we try to look at this in vivo. So here we've got some lovely soup. It's made of tomatoes, onions and lovage, which are all um, high in rutin or quercetin. And we fed it to um, a whole uh, range of individuals. Um, and so they had it in the morning for breakfast. They collected their urine for 24 hours. And then we looked at the production of these phenolic acids, hydroxy phenol, propionic acid, hydroxyphenol acetic acid, um, and 4-hydroxyhypuric acid, expecting to see a, a clear pattern of um, these phenolic acids coming through when they ate the soup. And there was some um, uh, similarities, but there was so much variation um, that it wasn't very clear um, that, uh, yes, you got more when they had the soup, but we added inulin on one of the days to the soup because in the in vitro, we saw an increase. And in some people, we saw an increase, but in others, we didn't. So there was a lot of individual variation. And then we tried um, uh, to feed this over a much longer period. So this is giving um, the same soup to... Um, to these people with or without inulin. And these are a different group of people. It's a parallel study who just got their habitual diet. And we couldn't find any difference between them. So maybe there's some adaptation over um, a six week period to how the microbiota handle these materials. So in summary, um, we had many different uh, molecules being produced but it's still very difficult to predict what will increase them. Um, there's lots of factors that we need to consider um, and we really need to have a lot more understanding of what they're doing in the body. So I think I went over time there, but I finished now. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. That was super fascinating. Um, one question that quickly came to my mind. You had a really nice slide explaining the relationship between diet diversity and microbiota diversity. So a lot of times now um, we when you know we when we look at the interaction between diet and the microbiota, um, we look at how the gut microbiota diversity has changed. Um, but I'm wondering if there's any opportunity that we can go beyond this matrix. Um, and and I love love to get your thoughts on that. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the um, diversity is, as I said, one of these words that just gets thrown about a little bit. Um, and I think it's it's important that we do have a lot of variety of different bacteria um, 
for sure, but there's a lot of redundancy and function as well in, in the colon. So different bacteria might do the same thing for, uh, with some compounds. Um, and, and it, it's, um, it's not necessary that you have this particular bacteria or that particular bacteria because different bacteria can function similarly. But I think that, um, uh, one of the biggest problems is that when you have um, so many possible species and um, strains, because we shouldn't think of all species as being identical, there's, you know, the same bacteria from the same species as being identical, they all have their own individual ways. Um, the bioinformatics required to, um, to understand what's going on there um, is 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 quite uh, sophisticated and to be honest i think a lot of the reporting that happens in in studies is people find it much easier to talk about biodiversity um in there rather than um thinking about the functionality um and i think from my experience certainly up to now um the uh, our ability to really tease out what's going on in terms of the functionality even so looking at the metabolome fecal metabolome looking at what's what's happening um we're still very limited um and uh we need much more sophisticated um, um analysis of the data to be able to see uh, what's really happening because everything is so varied the humans are varied diets varied the bacteria are varied um, and um, we're really having, um, you know, it's, we have a shortage of really good bioinformaticians. Mm -hmm. And I think at the moment, I see a lot of people using companies for their bioinformatics, and that limits things, I think, a little bit further. So if yeah. there's anyone in the audience who wants to train to be a bioinformatician, it's a very good thing to do. And I totally agree. And hoping we're also hoping for experts with um statistical experts with an understanding of the biology that's really going on yeah. um, that's one of the benefits we have had in glasgow in that we have very close relationship with um our um bioinformaticians and mathematicians who do understand the physiology and the uh, microbiology as well so for, um, you know, thinking about our audience today, we have students from various backgrounds. Uh, your talk gave a really nice focus on dietary fiber. And so for someone who might not be an expert in microbiome, but how would you think that this, you know, knowledge about the relationship between fiber and microbiome should change the way that we look at dietary pattern and maybe the role of fiber in dietary pattern. Yeah, so so we we need to understand a lot more about the food structure, the interactions between the different molecules, um, and um, not just think fiber. So it's not fiber intake. We need to think about what fiber intake. Um, and, and again, we need to think very much about this interaction with polyphenols, for example, because um, the polyphenols are often bound into the fiber. So some of them get absorbed in the small intestine um, and may even be circulated. They can get absorbed and then they get re-secreted into the gut through bile and then they go around and around in circles. Um, but um, some of them are bound within the structure and only get released in the colon when the bacteria can ferment uh, things. Now, the other thing the polyphenols can do is then interact with proteins and they're very good at binding to our um, uh, um, digestive proteins, our enzymes, and actually um, inhibit digestion. So lots of polyphenols in your fiber rich foods and you may be inhibiting trypsin. Um, you may be inhibiting starch digestion. Um, and in fact, we were doing some studies the other day in the lab, um, uh, fenugreek seeds um, reducing um, digestion of starch because of the polyphenols. Um, so there's a lot of interactions and we need to understand that it's very complex in foods. We tend to think that it's just something we eat, but actually the digestion is very complex. 
the interaction of the fiber and gut function is very complex before you get anywhere near the gut, the colonic microbiota. So we need to have this very holistic approach. And rather than just thinking I'm a microbiologist, I studied microbiota, we also have to think about the physiology, which is why my, my background, I actually, my first degree was actually in biochemistry and physiology. And then I studied bacteria for my PhD. So I pulled it together. But we have to have that, that overall view of things. And I remember back when they had, they produced the first um, microbiome analysis um, and particularly the metabolome analysis um, of the human as well. And I said, was the gut full or empty? Did you feed the person or not? And they looked at me as if I was mad. Mm -hmm. But of course... <laughs> If you want to look at the, the human metabolome after a meal, you'll soon find that it changes enormously. Um, so this is the, some of the disconnects that we get when we over-specialise and don't interact with people who understand the other body systems. And I'm sure you have the same experience yourself. Yeah, there, there's definitely lots of room for cross-disciplinary collaboration and research projects. So I guess maybe a more general student, general question for the students. You know, we have students coming from backgrounds like microbial, molecular nutrition, um, agriculture. Some are interested in climate change, epidemiology. Um, if they are interested in, you know, microbiome research and want to do a little bit more or want to learn a bit more, um, what would be your recommendations? Well. Um... Of course, all of these systems have their own microbiota as well. So the soil microbiota is going to be very important. There's a lot of interaction and people being very interested at the moment in this relationship between the soil microbiome and the human microbiome. After all, our plants are growing in it. And we're also helping to um, uh, provide some of the bacteria in the soil as well with our waste. Um, and... Um, in terms of the food production, um, uh, it's really important um, and climate change wise, um, understanding the um, uh, animal microbiome as well. So um, our dairy industry is very important um, and changing the microbiota of, of cattle um, by various means to reduce uh, methane production and so on is really important too. So I think that this field actually, um, from the neuroscientist to the um, farmer to the soil scientist is really very important. And the same uh, issues of the, of the bioinformatics, of the understanding of substrates and bacteria and interactions between different species that, you know, We've got we've got the same problems, and in fact, in um, in Glasgow this week, we have just launched a Scottish um, uh, group of um, um, scientists from all of those fields and fish agriculture and everything else. So the food producers, the physicists, the chemists, the agriculturalists, um, probably some neuroscientists in there as well. Um, to, to bring all of these experts together and, and really try and solve this for climate change, for sustainability and for health. And I think that's the way forward. We all have to work together. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing. Um, before I go on, I believe the audience, you know, could probably have some questions as well. We'll open up the floor. Um, anyone online or in the lecture hall would like to ask a question. Sure, yeah. Uh, want? Want go? Sure. Happy to ask a question. We could take, I'm sure, several. I have three, well, the first one's very small. Could you just name the group that you mentioned in Scotland right now that's doing that? that, that it was, uh, that, that's a bit silly of me. It's SCAT, so it's the Scottish, and I'm trying to think what C, what C stands for. Um, I can send you details. Yeah, no I worries. I think it might be of interest, actually, to the Freedman yeah. community, so that would be great. 
Um, it's um, it's agriculture and food. So it's a Scottish community of agriculture and food, or something like that. It's not quite that, but it's a long yeah. Time. But I can certainly send details um, of that, or even put it in the chat now if I can. Awesome, that would be great. And then two questions. One, um, there's some research coming out of Friedman looking at the question of ultra processed foods. So I was curious if you could comment on that in terms of the small intestine versus. The colon, I think that's one of the hypotheses about why ultra-processed foods as a group seem associated with certain outcomes. And then second, um, I'm curious, I'm not really in this field, but so I'm curious, you seem to do a lot of interventions that give people different foods to then try to um, change their microbiome. Do you experiment with um, fecal transplants or other things that actually try to transplant the bacteria themselves? And you know, why or why not? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes. Um, the well, let's deal with the ultra processed foods. I think there's a, obviously a big debate going on at the moment um, about what's ultra processed food as a what's the processing component and what's the evidence for the ultra processing component having the effect and and how much is it the dietary components in the food whether they're ultra processed or not if you know what I mean so there's there's a bit of an overlap between high sugar high salt high fat um, and the fact that the processing is important and I think this is really key because um, uh, if we are trying to create more structure in foods I mean if you eat natural plant foods or as as Hugh Trowell um, used to say when he brought the first definition of dietary fiber his definition was food with its clothes on and that always um, uh, makes me think very much about what the fiber hypothesis was originally that that the fiber protected the food and was intact around the food and then of course we break it all up when we process it and then try and make new foods out of it so obviously eating food as it were with its clothes on is the best way to eat the food um, but on the other hand a lot of the foods that are ultra processed are also um, as unhealthy as um, foods that are high in fat sugar and salt even without that layer of processing so I think we have to a few, sort of separate them out um, but the um, the issue really is how do we provide this complex system that our microbiota um, prefers to I mean they would love to live on very simple molecules so if we give them complex um, material then it does help to give them something to um, uh, colonize um, and slow things down, but also move things through the large intestine. You know, we don't want things to sit in the proximal colon, get completely fermented, and the distal colon starts uh, fermenting lots of protein and producing toxins, and, and maybe they hang around a long time because we've removed all of the residues that will push the food through and out. Um, uh, as fecal material. So I think we have to balance um, uh, all of these things and have uh, fibrous material, which is, you know, where we sort of people thought fiber was the stuff that came out the other end. Um, there's a lot of fibers that never get there because they're fermented. And we need to move fermentation throughout the colon, not just in the proximal colon, but through to the distal and, and um, increase the stall output. So I would say we need to have uh, um, a good flow through the gut. We need to have a good stall output and not eat such refined food that we um, are basically um, uh, fermenting everything, the proximal colon and allowing toxins in the large intestine, uh, distal large intestine where most disease occurs and we end up constipated. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, uh, probably one question for the uh, fecal uh, transplantation. Oh yes, the fecal if you can comment, yeah. Yes, um, I think that's an interesting uh, um, uh, situation. So uh, some of my colleagues are looking at fecal transplantations in in gut diseases. 
And of course, fecal transplantation works very well with Clostridium difficile um, infections, recurrent infections, and that, that's very much been looked at. Um, but they're also exploring it in, in other colonic and gut diseases. Um, but the problem always arises with these things is what sort of fecal transplant should you have? Um, you know, who is the donor if it's going to be um, uh, a, a proper fecal sample? Uh, or do you break it down? And I know there's quite a bit of research trying to find out which groups you could put in a capsule without having the full fecal material. So. I, I think we'll see a lot more really exciting research in, in the next few years, but there are lots of, of questions to be asked. And I always think it's quite interesting that we've, you know, we've, we've, we're going down that route now when maybe 30 years ago, everyone was getting colonic irrigation because they wanted to wash all their bacteria out. Um, it's it's quite interesting to see how we go sort of in circles sometimes. But yes, getting a more complex microbiota, but perhaps it's important to get that when you're younger, you know, get it um, established because with a lot of the changes we do to the microbiome, I'm not sure that we understand how long that's, that lasts. So if you get a fecal transplant, how long does it take before your original bacteria take over again? And we haven't got enough studies. I mean, people have started, but we haven't got enough studies to see that. We can see how quickly you get back after you've had antibiotics. But, you know, there's an awful lot of cross-talk between your uh, gut cells and your microbiota. And in early days, your bacteria can actually tell your gut cells to produce sugars on them, on their um membranes so that you that particular bacteria can can bind on and and, and stay. Um, so I think it's very complicated. Yes. Indeed. I, Go ahead, Ness. I have a couple of thoughts to add to what Dr. Edwards just said. Um, another thing that we have to think about is the fact that, you know, what Dr. Edwards has repeatedly mentioned, that diversity and variation across individuals and populations. And, you know, when it comes to fecal transplantation, a lot of people try to think of it as a one solution, like a one solution fits all scenario, but that's not the case at all. And if we think back to the beginning of our lives, for most babies, their first introduction of beneficial bacteria comes to them when they pass through their mom's vaginal canal and then get the first, you know, drink of breast milk and when they come in contact with their mother's skins. So it is very likely that the beneficial bacteria that's best for you have been passed down through your family, you know, in your family through generations. And so that's why, you know, I personally do a lot of nutrition intervention studies as well. That's why for a lot of us in this field, we try to go to nutrition intervention first because it's not invasive, because it could lead to sustainable lifestyle changes, because it could potentially um, help promote the beneficial bacteria that's the best for you, that's already in your gut. Um, mm -hmm. And we also encourage, you know, patients to think about their gut microbiome as an ecosystem. It's not just, and, and the, the ecosystem has been there for a while, and it's sort of grew up with you, and it's evolved with you throughout the years. And and also, Dr. Edwards mentioned earlier, you know, the ability of fiber intake to lower the pH level in your gut, and by lowering pH level in your gut, it sort of um, makes it difficult for the pathogens to flourish. So nutrition intervention has a great capacity to help optimize your personalized best gut microbiome. Totally agree. And just I have one more thing, and uh, uh, it's quite difficult. I totally agree with Dr. Edwards. Uh, complex and di uh, difficult to design a fecal transplantation uh, trials, especially in the U.S., because uh, the, the FDA regulations and many other ethical uh, issues. But yeah, if you specific, specifically interested on, on that 
topic and in the precision nutrition course there's one section dedicated on the fecal transplantation there's a you know guy from harvard is going to introduce some of the trial from israel so very nice <laughs> yeah and uh, uh, i have one question uh, uh, dr edwards so you, you you have one slice uh, uh, shows the the gut uh, brain axis uh, just curious, uh, and uh, so what? What are your thoughts on on, on that? The, the causal directions is a is a brain cause the the bad bacteria, bad germ uh, uh, grow, uh, you know, uh, more, or is a is a gut bacteria affect the, the brain uh, health? Well, well, it's both ways. I mean, you know, the the human body is or any animal body is very complex. So um, we have a lot of signaling going in both directions. Um, so, you know, if we get propionate into the brain, these small molecules can pass the blood-brain barrier. Some of the phenolic acids go through the brain barrier, definitely can affect um, how the brain is functioning. But on the other hand, even if we just look at satiety, you've got this um toing and froing so maybe propionate gets through to the brain and says oh you don't need to eat so much um slow down um but on the other hand the brain is sending the signals to um to to the gut as well influencing tone of the muscle um of course pleasure because um in humans eating is a pleasure and that's part of our problem that is too much pleasure for some of these very high fat and sugar foods. Um, so if you can get the brain um, to make us feel, uh, to, well, not make us feel, but increase the feeling of fullness for the same volume in the stomach or for the same stimulation of um, hormone reception in, in the small intestine, and then the colon, um, you see, the, it's very interesting when you get physiology involved because if you blow up a balloon in your colon, it affects your stomach a lot. So fullness in the colon inhibits gastric emptying, which will slow down the absorption of other things, but also make you feel fuller for longer. So a nice uh, fiber-full colon with lots of fermentation going on is going to have a potentially big impact on... Um, uh, what you want to eat and and the amounts of times that you want to eat. So I think there's a lot of information going in both directions. And, and, and uh, you know, the gut can sort of function on its own. I have done animal studies where I've taken the gut out and connected it up so it's perfused. And it contracts beautifully for many, many, many hours and does all the things you would expect it to do. Um because it doesn't need the brain, but the brain moderates what happens and can, can influence particularly our, our behavior in putting things into the gut. Fantastic. And how much diet can, can mediate that uh, brain-gut uh, axis and how, how important the diet can, can play a role there? Well, well, it's very important. So obviously, the more fermentation that goes on um, that can produce more um, things like propionate, then uh, the chances are that that will influence um, your behavior and eating. But also with the polyphenols, you need the building um, materials. So you need to have the right polyphenols in your diet to give the right phenolic acids that are produced by the bacteria that then have the impact on, on, on brain function. And it comes down to diversity again. I mean, at the moment, um, in Europe, at least, we're telling children to eat the rainbow. Um, lots of different coloured fruit and vegetables um, and foods, not too much coming from red, high alcohol red wine. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's getting that variety uh, uh, that's going to make a big difference. Got it. Thank you so much. I, I think it's about the time we have to stop here. Some students will have another class. So thank you so much again for uh, Dr. Edward and also for Dr. Zhao for moderating the, 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 the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a great